and we'll be having the other leaders from the legislature on the show here as soon as we can get them scheduled. So let's get into it now with this week's panel. Karen DeWitt is from New York State Public Radio. John Campbell is from Gothamist and WNYC. I'm so happy to say that. I know, and welcome <laughs> to the public broadcasting world. And We're yeah. thrilled. All public media roundtable. Look of at this. Course. I know. Yes. An all public media show this week. <laughs> Very fun. So we're talking about State of the State and a few other things. John, what was your reaction to it? It's It was Kathy Ogle's first day of the state, maybe her last day of the state. Yeah, well, I mean, she's still the front runner for, for election at this right. point. But, uh, you know, one of the things that really, really stood out to me, and, and obviously it was a, a theme of the speech, she called her speech a new era for New York, and that was a very clear reference to breaking from the old era, the Andrew mm. Cuomo era. And she, right at the beginning of the speech, made a point to say that the days of, of uh, petty beefs with the, the New York City mayor are over. I don't think she used the word beef, but uh, that, that's my <laughs> word. Uh, and the day, uh, days of, of fighting for credit with the legislature are over. That was meant to be a very clean break from Andrew Cuomo, and, and she never explicitly mentioned his name, but, you know, the, the implicit mention was there. But, you know, you also, this was very much a Kathy Hochul speech, not, an, uh, not what we've been used to for the last 10 years. It was, it was pretty brief. It was, mm -hmm. it was about 33 minutes or mm -hmm. so. And there weren't these, like, big headline-grabbing proposals that Andrew Cuomo used to try to do. Um, you know, I remember back to a, a, a huge convention center in Queens that he wanted to build that was one of his uh, headline uh, proposals that never ended up happening. But, you know, this was a more realistic, smaller agenda, I think, than what we, we've seen in years past. But it was, you know, very Kathy Hochul. She made it her own. You know, I don't. I don't buy just yet that the beef between the governor and the mayor is is all fresh and new and everything's going to be great because Eric Adams is such a strong personality. Well, probably not, but I, I yeah. think what she's saying, she's not deliberately going to pick yes. fights like right. her predecessor did right. all yeah. the so, time. So, Karen, what was your reaction to this? Well, speech? I was uh, the pool reporter inside the chamber. John and I drew lots. And <laughs> I lost. But um, <laughs> so it was supposed to be capped at 50 people, but really it felt like there was about 10 people in there. That's what it, it felt was, like from watching the feed. It was yeah. just strange. It was so subdued. And, you know, she didn't get any cheers when she came on, no applause for any of her proposals, no boos, no hecklers, at least. She didn't, <laughs> she didn't have to face that, which Andrew Cuomo had to a couple of times. But it was, sh it was short. It was to the point. As John said, she laid out, this is a new era. I have some proposals. And she is talking about spending a lot of money, $10 billion on health care, a $1 billion property tax break. The state is really flush with cash because tax revenues came in higher than expected. You've got all this federal... Uh, aid packages that came in. So it was she was able to give a lot of good news. Oh, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And she actually has the money. You know, previous governors came in and there was, you know, a $10 billion spending gap and they'd have to, you know, have austerity measures and, yeah. you know, tax increases. So I think she got the benefit of that. But I think it was a little bit of a shame that this is the first woman governor, her first state of the state. And she didn't get any applause, she didn't get any credit, but, you know, she just had to just talk to the camera and talk to the people in New York. Right, a lot of people had called the speech low energy, including Assembly Republican leader Will Barclay that we just heard from on the show uh, from Daryl's reporting. Well, it's and tough without an audience. It, exactly, that's, you know, that's, that's just, the thing. It really is. is. <laughs> as you and I know, as broadcasters, when you have an audience, there's a different energy. Plus, and everyone's sick with COVID. I mean, the yeah. Assembly Speaker couldn't even be there because you had to take a, a rapid test before you got in the chamber, and he tested out with a, he got a, he tested positive. Um, right. For COVID. Something that wasn't in the speech that made not really headlines but ruffled some feathers was sexual harassment. You know, we had this big scandal with the governor last year where he was ousted over sexual harassment. He resigned. He wasn't fired, obviously. Uh, we had sexual harassment advocates coming out and saying, you know, we're really disappointed that she didn't make this a hallmark of the speech. And that ties into ethics and JCOPE, uh, the state's ethics agency, and what, what goes from there. How are we going to replace that if we replace it? So, uh, Karen, where do you see that conversation going? You've been, you've been through more than one ethics panel. In that's right. That's right. And if J-Cope ends, I'm going to have so much more free time in my life from trying to write <laughs> J-Cope stories and explain them to people. She wants to replace this troubled panel with 15 law school deans, which sounds kind of crazy, but hmm. she doesn't have a lot of options without, you know, making a constitutional amendment change. And they, the law school deans could pick people, it'd be a rotating panel, and that would give some distance from the legislature and the governor that they wouldn't be able to control the panel. 
I mean, not yeah. as much. There's always yeah. politics that happen, but it'll be a lot harder than the system now where the governor directly appoints most of the people on Jay Cope. And we saw that Jay Cope was really, you know, frankly, a tool of the former governor to protect him against any uh, troubles that he had. And he had a lot of troubles at the end. Yeah. yeah and, and I think it, it kind of highlights how difficult it is to, to figure out who should be enforcing ethics rules in New York State. You know, we've seen appointees by, by political, uh, you know, elected officials that doesn't work all the time. So the idea is law school deans that, you know, you take five out of a rotating cast of 15 and mm -hmm. that gives them some distance. But even then, uh, you know, I saw uh, Blair Horner of, of the New York Public Interest, Re Interest Research Group told Karen that, right. you know, well, law schools lobby, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and, and Jay Cope is in charge of uh, regulating lobbyists. This new panel would be in charge of that. So w the, the problem is there's no perfect answer. I think they're trying to get closer to a good answer. And under well, her, big, go ahead. I'm again. just going to say the bigger issue is just the culture of corruption that's yes. been tolerated in Albany for so long that people, you know, some lawmakers assume I'm going to get away with what I can, and they have, and I've seen very many of them through the years do that. And so when you have that culture, it's hard to police them too. If everybody kind of agreed that, yeah, we're not going to be engaged in anything unethical, it would be a lot easier. Right. And I'm not saying that other places are perfect, but there are some states where they don't get mired in corruption in the same <laughs> way that it does here, right? Hope springs eternal. Right, right. Speaking of scandal, it is Friday morning. We are taping right now. Former Governor Andrew Cuomo is scheduled to be in court this afternoon. We're expecting the criminal charge against him to be dropped. Uh, John, I want to go to you. Are we expecting anything specific or... I guess, what are we looking for here? Well, th this criminal complaint, which was filed by the, the Albany County Sheriff, Craig Apple, back in October, it, it was kind of doomed from the start. Yeah. There was this, this riff between the sheriff and the district attorney, David Soares, where the sheriff didn't give the district attorney a heads up. They were both kind of doing parallel investigations at the same time. They weren't, clearly weren't on the same page. The district attorney warned that the filing was potentially defective in November. I mean, so... It was. It really spelled a bad path for this this criminal complaint, uh, and and that that concluded this week on Monday or, or Tuesday earlier this week when uh, David Soares revealed that he he doesn't intend to prosecute the, the case. Albany County DA David Soares. So the, the the case centers around Brittany Camisso, a, an, an aide to, to Governor Cuomo, who says that that the governor groped her uh, in late 2020. Uh, she's very disappointed in this. She intends to pursue a, a civil action or explore a civil action. That may be where we, we see this, this case go. And Soares did say that he found the chart, you know, her allegations credible, but he didn't think there would be enough evidence to go to trial, which they has also raised some questions. And certainly, again, you mentioned the sexual harassment, anti-sexual harassment groups in the legislature and, you know, Cuomo's alleged victims are all saying, well, why other crimes get prosecuted, you know, with in a small amount of evidence? Why are they pulling back from this one? Exactly. It's going to be an interesting case to watch today. We'll have the latest up on our website, obviously, when that happens uh, this afternoon, by the time this show airs, actually. Mm -hmm. So we'll leave it there. Karen DeWitt from New York State Public Radio, John Campbell from WNYC and Gothamist. I'm not going to get tired of saying that. Thank you both so much. <laughs>